uh, past couple of weeks, we've been in this series called uh, Theologian, uh, as you saw, and we've been looking at different theological concepts presented in the book of Romans. And we've been preaching uh, through Romans uh, very exegetically, and, and we're going to sort of take a detour from that today and talk about our core values. Now, since we put up this beautiful screen that we can show these uh, sick graphics on, um, we haven't had our core values as prominent and present uh, while we preach. Uh, at our old space, we had the four squares behind us for like five years. Uh, and then when we first moved here, before we got the TVs, uh, we had the four squares behind us. But um, Sam, if you know him, if you don't, that's okay. But we are Bible teaching people reaching, community building, and disciple making. These are our core values. And we have a few phrases uh, that we like to repeat uh, often as a church, one of them being our vision statement, and that is that we exist to lead everyone to love Jesus and live fully surrendered to him. Now, that's a very lofty vision and something that's going to be difficult to accomplish, but we're going to strive to accomplish that vision through various goals that we set. Our current goal uh, is to lead 5% of Yankton to love Jesus and live fully surrendered to him. Uh, just to make that more tangible, that's 750 people that we want to lead to Christ here in Yankton. You know what that means, church? We got to get busy, number one. Thank you, Jody. We got to get busy. Uh, number two, we got to get four services. Y'all ready? All right. Next week, next week, family, we're, we're rocking four services. Team, no, I'm playing. I'm playing. Oh, we ain't ready. We ain't ready for that. We're just looking at three services right now. Well, in order to get there, we got to multiply to four. But we accomplish those goals through our strategic core values, right? That we, we aren't uh, just a Bible teaching church, uh, but my hope and prayer for each one of you is that each one of us are Bible teachers. That we don't just go to a Bible teaching church, but that we are Bible teachers. That we don't just reach the people who want to be reached or have already been reached, but we go to the people who are far from God and distant from God and who even are opposed or even hate God, and we bring them into a close relationship with him. Uh, my hope is that we don't just build a community here that's a pocket community like Pastor Jeff was talking about, but that uh, we build irresistible community here and uh, everywhere we go, and that we don't just value robotic disciple-making, but each one of us values discipleship relationships in which we grow and give each other wonderful wounds and sharpen one another up as iron sharpens iron. Amen, church? And these core values are worked into every part of Restore Church in our kids' ministry, in our youth ministry, everything uh, that operates on Sunday morning, Wednesday evening, and throughout the week. And these core values are important because they build culture over time. And I think we've done a really good job championing these values and building a culture here at Restore where we welcome the people who are distant from God, where they can have a place here, uh, where we welcome being able to teach the Bible and, and, and preach the Bible in a way that you can relate to. Uh, I think we do a really good job of building a culture in which discipleship relationships form naturally. And uh, like Pastor Jeff was talking about with Movie at the Meridian, we build irresistible community, not as a pocket community, but as part of the community. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Uh, Pastor Jeff and I have sort of this um, running joke that we have an, another core value, uh, and it's called statistic breakers. That spooked me. Ooh. Oh. Anyone else jolt at that? No, just me? Okay. All right. We're good. I just had a mini heart attack. We have a running joke that we're statistic breakers breakers, all right? Statistic breakers, because we have broken so many statistics. Statistics say that we should not be uh, this size and this quality in this size of town, right? Uh, statistics say there's this thing called the 80% rule uh, that says when 80% of the chairs are filled up or when 80% of the parking lot is filled up, then people are more likely to leave and not come back. Uh, our old space, we packed like a billion people into a tiny space. Who was with us in our, in our Locust Street, right? We fit a 115 people in a space that can now barely hold 20 youth group students, okay? Listen, we did that, all right? We broke the statistic, and we continue to break statistics, but we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Here's why. There are churches across America who also have had this idea, this concept, that they were statistic breakers too. And what ended up happening 
what ended up happening for a lot of them is that the statistic caught up to them. So we have to be careful not to be too prideful in our assumption. You see, what ended up happening with a lot of these ministries is they developed what we call a siloed ministry approach. You guys know what grain silos are. Uh, this, is, this approach to ministry is generally unintentional because nobody wants to have siloed ministries in which instead of they're a part of the church, they're a part from the church. Uh, th- nobody wants that. It's always unintentional. But here's the thing. It can and will happen if we are not intentional about what we're talking about today. Uh, so last week I introduced this idea of a new core value, uh, and, and so we're going to look at that today. Uh, but I want to preface this. This conversation is, is so big, uh, and, and there's so many different factors. I can't talk about all of them, nor can I explain everything, but what I'm going to do is cast vision for this new core value called Generation Shapers, uh, and, and we're going to look at uh, the major problem that we see in America today with the church, and we're going to offer up a solution. Uh, so with that being said, are you guys ready? I didn't hear you. Are you ready? All right, let's start our journey to becoming Generation Shapers. We now have five squares. Uh, That was just the graphic. I wanted to make it memorable. I wanted to make it uh, cool and and just presentable. So that's why we threw that together. But uh, that is our our new uh, sort of badge that we're going to put on all of our merch. So whoever has four square stuff, guess what? You got the OG. You got the OG. Listen, you could probably sell those on eBay when we get big, when we get real big. Okay? (laughs) Anyway. All right. Let me move forward here. Let me move forward. So I think, I think there are a few things that are important to the conversation that we're going to have today. Um, and before I get into those, those few things, I, I just want to share with you that um, these items are uh, kind of heavy. Uh, and so I, I need you guys to just be ready to, to hear some things that uh, are going to weigh heavy, and, and you're going to feel the responsibility uh, that, that we have as a church, as parents, and as the unmarried and the widows. Uh, all in raising up uh, this next generation. Um, uh, The very first thing I want to share with you, in the last 10 years, uh, a lot of things have changed, some for the better and and some for the worst. Um, uh, The national average on church attendance uh, has decreased by 13% over the last 10 years. So uh, churches are decreasing in size on average more than 13% over the course of 10 years. Uh, so that's a huge number. That's a huge number of people. Uh, but in addition to that number, most Christians, about 50% of Christians, only attend church once or twice every month. So not only are less people coming to church, but the number of times people attend church throughout the year is also decreasing to the point where instead of there being 52 Sundays in which we gather together or Wednesdays, there are only, what is that, 26 Quick math. That's what a college education will get you guys. Whew, that was hard. <laughs> Gears are turning, okay? But uh, church attendance has decreased, and the number of, time, uh, number of times people attend church in a month has also decreased, which is a problem. Uh, the second thing is, uh, over the last 10 years, the instance of mental health disorders, specifically uh, severe uh, major depressive disorder has increased by over 275% in teenagers. Okay, so hear me. Teenagers, this demographic over the last 10 years, there has been an increase of 275% in the number of individuals struggling with severe major depressive disorder, diagnosable by a physician or uh, um, a psychiatrist. This is a big problem. 80% of teenagers age 15 to 18, 80%, sorry, excuse me, 80% of teenagers age 12 to 17 have been exposed to explicit material. The average uh, between 15 and 17 is about 95% that have been exposed to this material. Uh, 10% of those individuals, of teenagers who were surveyed, uh, were exposed to explicit material before they were 10 years old. Uh, the average age of exposure to explicit content, however you want to define that, uh, is anywhere from 9 years old to 12 years old. 
something's happening here. These are symptoms of a much larger problem, and that problem is somebody else is discipling our kids. Somebody else is discipling our kids. How do I know that? Well, here, here's how I know that. Uh, so, excuse me, 60 to 80% of kids raised up in the church are leaving the church by the time they graduate or after they graduate. 60 to 80%. Let me just put some tangible numbers on those. Um, here in Yankton, South Dakota, there is anywhere from 350 to over 500 uh, students uh, ages 12 to 18 who are currently struggling with any uh, manner of mental uh, health issues, depression, anxiety, trauma. There are over 500 of them uh, who have had at least one uh, major depressive episode or are currently in the process of struggling with it. Uh, there are over 300 teenagers, uh, that means 12 to 17 in Yankton right now, who were exposed to explicit material before they were 10 years old. That's 300 kids. Uh, you, you probably saw kids running around, kids running around uh, and having fun in church, which we love to see. 60 to 80% of those kids, those very ones, will one day leave the church. But guess what? We're kind of statistic breakers. We're kind of statistic breakers. And so my goal here today isn't to let uh, the statistics overwhelm us, but it's to present us with an option and a, and a solution to move forward. And that is generation shapers. Uh, because we're not going to stand idly by and let culture influence our kids. Uh, no, we're going to stand up and say, uh, say no to that. We're not going to let them steal our kids away. Uh, we are going to Work diligently to create resilient disciples of Christ. What is a really resilient disciple? Here is how we define it. A resilient disciple or resilient disciples are Jesus followers who are resiliently faithful in the face of cultural coercion, who live a vibrant life in the spirit. So that's the end goal. The end goal is to build up all of the children and all of the students who come through Restore Church into these resilient disciples who are, are resilient against cultural coercion and who have vibrant life in the spirit. And so to do that, I want to share with you three traits of a generation-shaping church as a, a generation-shaping body uh, that will help us achieve that goal. Are you guys ready? Uh, man, you all don't sound ready. Are you ready? Come on. The first trait of a generation-shaping church is this, a family of real faith. A family of real faith. And, and this has two aspects to it. The very first is in the home, and the second is in the church. So I'm going to start off with the home. Uh, but uh, parents, I'm going to talk to you, but uh, all, the, all the singles, uh, the unmarried and the widows, listen, I'm coming for you later. So uh, just sit tight. Um, you'll, you'll get some too, all right? So one of the biggest misconceptions about church, uh, about Christianity, is that uh, the church is the sole place where discipleship uh, and, and spiritual maturity happens, right? Where, where adults come to learn about the things of God and where kids come to learn about the things of God. Uh, like, we don't uh, do anything at home. It's like, you go to church, you learn, you do, go through the programs, and then boom, you're saved and you're, uh, you're a disciple and, and you're good, right? Uh, like, that's, that's sort of the, the cultural uh, look on the church. But uh, here's the problem with that view and with that sort of mind frame. Um, when Jesus uh, went out into the wilderness uh, before he began his ministry, uh, he fasted for 40 days, uh, and, and uh, he was tempted by Satan. And Satan came to him with a number of things, but uh, one of the most notable things that he came to him with was, uh, hey, if you're really the son of God, uh, why don't you command these stones to be bread? And uh, I, I, if I were in that position uh, after fasting for 40 days, would have converted the stones into bread. Um, and, and, I mean, that's just my sinful self. But Jesus, being the Son of God and resistant to temptation, said this, no, because man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the Lord. So what Jesus is teaching us, what the law is teaching us here, is that uh, the word of God and the things of God are spiritual food for us. Amen? Uh, I know intermittent fasting is sort of a popular uh, diet right now, but uh, fasting for six days and then binging for one ain't, ain't good. Okay? It isn't good. Trust me. I know. Um, 
Pastor Jeff is really into fitness, okay? Super into fitness, and I'm more into fitness pizza in my mouth. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> Pastor Jeff is super into fitness, and this guy, this guy, I tell you what, you can hear him huffing and puffing, just lifting heavy in his office. Brother's got a full weight rack of a billion pounds, and sometimes you just hear him grunting like a power, like a power lifter, just yelling, and the walls are shaking because he's moving so much weight. I think, I think he's moving the earth sometimes. Like he's just stationary, and everything around him is moving. Is that is that too much flattery? Oh, keep going. All right. <laughs> Last time I talked about being a people pleaser, and it's showing, okay? Sucking up to the boss. Uh, Anyway. Uh, But Pastor Jeff knows that in order to get stronger, he has to have the basic building blocks for muscle, and those are proteins, amino acids, carbohydrates. He needs energy. Uh, and, And if we want our kids to be resilient disciples, to be resilient, to be strong, uh, then they also have to build up their spiritual muscles. And so they have to have the correct building blocks for that, which is uh, faith and and, and learning about the the Word of God, not just at church, but also uh, at home. Amen? Amen. So... um, how, how do we sort of get there? Because parents, I kind of I know where you're at. Um, you're like, Pastor Jacob, you're a single dude. You ain't got no kids. You don't know what it's like. Trust me, uh, I kind of do um, for the most part. Uh, we live in the busiest generation, okay? Kids are so busy. How many parents we got in the room? How many of your kids got stuff going on like every night of the week? Yeah. Yeah, there are things, yes, there are things going on every night of the week. And so, like, you, you, maybe, maybe you're like, dude, I don't know what to do. Like, uh, we've got basketball one day, we've got soccer the next day, then there's track, and then there's dance, and then they have to learn jujitsu, and then uh, they have to study for the ACT and the, the MCAT, the LSAT. they got to take their medical boards, and they got to do all, you know, X, Y, and Z. And you're like, oh, what time do I have left uh, to even talk about the things of God? And maybe, maybe you're like, I don't even know how to teach my kids about Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm brand new to this whole thing. How do, I, how do I do this? I've got a few things for you, okay? And I've got a verse uh, from the book of Deuteronomy, which we, it's, that's weird. We're reading from there, right? Come on. Uh, Deuteronomy. Can you guys say that? There you go. Come on. Come on. You guys are doing great. You guys are doing fantastic. Anyone else warm? Anyone else really warm? I am sweating here. All right, we're cooking. We're cooking. We're going to be in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, and we're going to be reading verses 4 through 7. And this is called the Shema. It says this, here, and it's called the Shema because here in Hebrew is Shema. Shema Israel, Yehovah. It's here, O Israel. I'm not going to start speaking in tongues, I promise you, Pastor. I'm interpreting. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. How many of you guys got chairs in your house? Yeah? Anybody got a couch? I just can't afford them. <laughs> oh, sorry, Emily. Uh, chairs? You got a car? Everyone got, got beds? Tuck your kids in? Yeah, man, we got to get you guys some beds and chairs and couch. There's very few of you who have beds, chairs, and couches. Man. All right, we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. All right, I'll preach to the people who do have beds, chairs, and couches. Listen, uh, we, have, we have this opportunity to th- share about the things of God while we're sitting down. And while we're walking along the road, well, we don't really walk places anymore. We drive while we're driving along the road, while we're sitting down to heat uh, before we go to bed, when we get out of bed. Uh, we have these, uh, this plentiful opportunity to speak about the things of God, but... but You know, the Lord is talking to Israel, to to Moses, then commanding Israel uh, to to do this in a time when the written word of God, right, when the Bible uh, wasn't compiled yet and they didn't have uh, a billion copies of this book. It was transmitted mostly by word of mouth. And, and, And so what this passage is really telling us is that we need to demonstrate that this faith is real, not just on Sunday mornings when we can lift our hands and speak to the mountains and tell them to move, uh, but on Monday morning and Tuesday morning and Wednesday morning and
and Thursday and Friday and Saturday back to Sunday. Like this, kids need to know that this faith that we share, that we hold to, is real. Pastor Jeff shared with me a really cool story about how he takes his kids uh, to do ministry work with him, uh, not just on Sunday mornings when they're running around the church, uh, but uh, throughout the week. Uh, Brittany does the same thing. She'll bring uh, the kids into the kids' wing and do work and prepare uh, and show and demonstrate that this faith that we have is real. And that's what the kids need. Like, they don't need a 12-week interactive, inductive Bible study over the book of Revelation about the 12 horns and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls and the angels and the witness. Like, they don't need that, right? Like, that's not that helpful, but it could be. Um, Pastor, I'm talking to you. We're doing Revelation here, okay, in a little bit, right? Yep, okay, so that's coming. So we're going to have a, a few weeks on that. Okay, uh, but families, kids just need to know that this faith is real. That this faith we have is resilient. They're so observant. They can tell. They can tell when it's fake. They can see right through it. And, and so that sort of leads us into the church. Like, how does the church fit into that? Well, you know, I, I, like, I'm going to, during the sermon, I'm going to share some things that are, that are pretty vulnerable. And you might be like, ooh, they let him be a pastor? Um, so just, like, know that I'm, I'm going to be vulnerable with you. And, I'm, you know, I might be a little less confident. But... Um, does anyone here sort of see transformation happen in someone's life and then is kind of cynical about it? Like maybe doubts that it's actually happening and you're like, ah, I don't really know if it's real. I don't really know if they're, if they're truly changed. Because I, I have that feeling uh, a lot of the time. And a lot of the youth uh, students, um, younger individuals, uh, they're really perceptive, uh, especially middle school girls. They can just see like any insecurity, dial in, and just rip it apart, okay? I know that from experience from when I was a middle schooler. And also as a youth pastor. Um, we're not going to talk about how they bully me. Um, anyway. Um, but they can see the authenticity behind things. They can see whether or not something is real or not. Uh, they did a survey on attendance. Uh, they being, I think it was Barna Research, did a survey on youth group attendance. And, and when games and things were promoted, uh, when fun activities were promoted, the attendance was less, much less than when uh, all that was promoted was the preaching of God's word. So, uh, they don't want the flashy things. They just want real, authentic relationship in which they can hear and know the things of God are true. And, um, they're not here this service, but I was picking on them last service. I have two leaders in the, in the youth group who are incredible. Uh, they're a married couple, uh, Tyler and Jade. If you see them or if you don't know them, find them, get to know them. They're wonderful people. Jade is an absolute animal, okay? When I tell you she's an animal, she's an animal. Sister does discipleship with four girls, okay? Four high school girls. She is discipling them and pouring into their life, teaching them the things of God, being the person uh, that they need, and, and she's doing it with four girls, spending not just time on Wednesdays, but time throughout the week on Sunday evening when, uh, when her kids need her attention. She's uh, reaching out to them, okay? And, and then Tyler is discipling another young man who most of us, if we saw him or we interacted with him, we would look at him and say, nah, and then walk away. Like, this is, this is real. Like, Tyler is pouring into lives of students who most people, when we would look at them or we would see them, would be like, cynical, no tr real transformation, uh, I'm just going to go this way, right? Uh, this is how we as a church build up this, uh, a family of real faith, is by pouring into the students and the kiddos that worship here. Brittany's a perfect example of the, the kids' ministry that she has worked so hard to build. There are, yeah, give God some praise for that. Right now, there are kids in classrooms. I had to check and see if they were singing still. They, they have, there are kids in classrooms who are learning about Jesus, and there are helpers and teachers who are pouring into them at this very moment. All right? Uh, and, and then there's another man in this church. I'm not going to name him because he, he's shy and, he, you know, he's very humble. Uh, but he's doing the same thing. Uh, he is pouring into a, a high school student uh, who... Uh, didn't even go to church here. 
And he's been pouring into him, and he's pouring into other young men. Uh, Here's the biggest indicator of whether or not a child will succeed in life. It's whether or not they have at least one, uh, how does this language, how's this language exactly? At least one, hold up, whether they have at least one stable and committed relationship with an adult other than their parent. This is how we determine whether or not uh, a child is going to be successful, whether or not they have a stable and committed relationship with another adult apart from their parents. This is it. And that's why it's so incredible uh, what Jade and Tyler are doing, what this other man is doing, and then what these other uh, volunteers are doing right now in the kids' ministry, demonstrating love, which leads us to the second trait of a generation-shaping church, which is radical love. Radical love. One of my favorite things to do after sitting through first service and getting absolutely steamrolled by the Holy Spirit uh, and the Word of God is I just like to take some time and just meditate. And to do that, I sometimes like to sneak over to the kids' wing and uh, watch the kids sing praise out to God. Uh, because the Lord says, like, we have to have childlike faith. And sometimes I just need to study uh, what that looks like, because sometimes I lose sight of it. Um, but one of the other things that I do is I, I go into the, into the nursery, and I hang out with these two, uh, son, Zeke. Uh, and Zeke is the most lovable uh, little child I have ever met. Uh, dude will run up to you, give you a hug, throw a block in your face, sit down, want you to read a book, steal your phone, throw your hat, uh, and then just all while smiling and being the cutest little dude uh, anyone has ever seen. And it is so easy to love him. It's so easy to love him. Uh, Because he loves me. I've I've developed this relationship with him. Uh, But there are some babies who just like, they look at me and they cry and they hate me. Uh, and it's harder to, <laughs> to love a kid who hates you, right, or someone who hates you, because even the unbelievers love those who love them, right? Uh, but it's much more difficult to love someone who hates you. And I'm not saying these babies hate me, uh, but um, some of these kids are, are really hard to love, and I could admit that, because I'm a sinner, and I show favoritism, I do. Uh, but there are some kids uh, who are just difficult to love. I think we can admit that as a church. And if you're saying, oh, who let this guy be a pastor? Like, come on. We all know you have a favorite kid, and it's not the middle one. Uh, I know. I was the middle child, okay? (laughs) Uh, Man, I had to just drop that joke because it's getting a little heavy in here, okay? Um, But while I'm playing with Zeke, and there might be some other kids crying in the nursery, and I don't really know how to deal with a, a crying, screaming baby. Um, uh, I just, I look at, um, I look at the volunteers who uh, are just so quick to show them uh, a little bit of radical love. Uh, I think of my aunt, who serves faithfully in the kids' ministry, who is so quick to pick up a crying baby. Uh, anytime there's a new baby in the church, uh, watch out, because she's going to jack that baby, and she's going to hold it. And if you know my aunt, you know what that means. But she is so ready to show radical love to these babies. But not just the babies. We can, all of us could walk over to a classroom right now and, and see the teachers and the helpers in any one of the classrooms demonstrating radical love to kids who would, uh, when they walk through this front door over here, uh, they might be thinking, I am unlovable. I think about, in my life, the people who radically loved me in in my life situation, uh, having, you know, my mom raise three kids on her own and and just really struggling and and feeling unlovable. I think about the few people uh, who loved me really, really well. I wasn't going to share this story, uh, but when I was eight years old, my cousin Dana went to Yankton High School, uh, and she was really good friends with these two, uh, I think, or at least one of them, Dana. Shelsky Fetke, I can't remember her last name, my bad, Um, Fetke, and uh, they brought me down to uh, a church service down at the lake in which we were catching fish, and I'm pretty sure Pastor Jeff gave me a fishing rod, or as someone that looked like him gave me a fishing rod, Uh, and, and, and it was just these small moments of radical love that someone poured into me uh, that, that gave me a little bit of hope. You know, uh, 
young men in, in this world who, who feel like uh, they can't be loved, listen, uh, when an older person steps up and just shows them a little bit of love, it will transform their life. I think of Zoe Care. Everyone know what Zoe Care is, our Pregnancy Resource Center? Uh, it, all it takes is, is one woman named Rachel Jones to just show a little bit of love, or the volunteers to show a little bit of radical love to a mother, and, and her life could be transformed, and the baby's life uh, could be transformed right? Uh, I think of our rap ministry, our foster care ministry. Uh, we've got uh, Leah, I don't know if she's here, Melissa and Megan, also my aunt. They're all serving in a lot of different capacities, uh, but they're crushing it, right? Rap is absolutely crushing it. The foster care ministry in Yankton is absolutely crushing it. They open up their home to kids that you and I, uh, you know, just, we probably wouldn't find it too easy to love them, right? Can we be honest here for a minute, church? Can we be honest? And they open up their home and they show them just a little bit of radical love. And what does that love do? It it transforms them. Uh, In in preparation for this uh, sermon specifically and and for this idea of generation shapers, Brittany and I have been reading this book called uh, Resilient. And in there, uh, the author uh, speaks about uh, the, the Parkland shooter. You guys remember the Parkland shooter? killed 17 kids and, and educators. This author uh, was invited onto a radio show shortly after that happened. And before even saying anything crazy, uh, she, she simply said something radical. She said, radical love would have saved Nicholas Cruz and those 17 children and faculty members. Radical love would have saved a young man who was hurt and broken. There are, uh, right now, in in this very moment, there are kids sleeping in the Department of Social Services building. There are kids sleeping in homeless shelters. There are kids sleeping in hotels without families to go back to. And I hope... I hope that breaks our heart. And church, I'm going to ask a really big favor. Like, this is serious. I'm asking that every household that has capacity and the ability, would you sign up to be a foster family? Would would we be the solution to the problem that we see in our society today? Can we show a little bit of radical love to the families who, who, who need it? to the kids who need it. Because the world is coming after them. The world hates them. But we need to show them that we love them. Uh, the, this is what Jesus said. He said, the world will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. And so church, we need to, we need to show a little bit of radical love to the kids who walk through this door, uh, who, are, uh, who seem a little bit uh, unlovable. Okay, uh, the ones who, uh, who are hard to love, the ones who are kicking and screaming or putting holes in the wall, uh, whatever it might be, uh, church, we just need to show them a little bit of radical love. And Pastor Jeff is going to share a story uh, after we close, uh, which I want you to hold on for just to demonstrate what radical love can do for us. And this radical love sort of brings us into the final, uh, final trait of a generation-shaping church, and that is we are one church. We are one church. They are not the future church. The kids right here, I'm going to talk to these kids. Hey, kids. Hi. Can you say hi? Hi. These kids that are sitting up front doing so well, you guys aren't the future church. You know that? You guys are the church right now, but I'm Bob is what he says, but I'm Bob. And kids are great. They are not the future church. They are the church right now. The youth students are not the future church. They are the church right now. And and in order to be uh, a pro-generation shaping, we have to... uh, Believe that that is true, that these kids share the same image that you and I share, the same image that that God gave us when he said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, the same vocation, the same calling, right? The same uh, commission that is given to us has been given to them. And if we don't prepare them 
to be adults in the church, they won't be adults in the church. If we don't prepare them uh, to be resilient disciples, they won't be resilient disciples. If we just say, if we just say, hey, we're going to throw them through all of this stuff and, and, and view church as a program uh, and not as this relationship and this discipleship and, and not bring it in the home, uh, the world is going to gobble them up. The world will gobble them up like they gobbled me up. Like they gobbled some of us up. But God wins. I, I, I don't know if this, is, uh, if this is a promise, but I know it's wisdom. Proverbs 22, 6. Raise a child up in the way they should go, and they will not depart from it. And so, church, we have a dire calling. We have a dire calling. Uh, Jesus says, do not prohibit them to come to me. But what does he say? What does Jesus say? For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these, these kids. Uh, at Restore Youth, we have this verse that we cling really tightly to, and it's First, first Timothy 4.12, and it says this, do not let anyone despise you for your youth, but set an example for all believers in word, conduct, faith, love, and purity. And so church, we have to raise these children and these students up in the way that they should go, that they might be resiliently faithful and resiliently uh, being, uh, being resilient against cultural coercion and demonstrate uh, real life in the spirit. We have a mission. We have a value, a strategic core value to shape the culture and change the culture. Because church, what are we? We're generation shapers. What are we, church? Generation shapers. What are we, church? And what do we do? We shape generations. We make resilient disciples. That one wasn't as clear, so I'm sorry about that. We shape generations. We are generation shapers. We are one church, and we are going to start today to build up these resilient disciples over the next uh, couple of months and years and next season of ministry, uh, Brittany and I are going to begin working on uh, different family discipleship classes and parenting classes and, and developing a family discipleship model, all of which is, is on the foundation of being generation shapers. Uh, in church, uh, that starts today with something we like to call Family Dedication Day. Uh, so parents who, have, who are participating in this, uh, you should have gotten an email from me. Uh, you are free to go get your kids from kids' ministry real quick as I close uh, and, and pray for us. Um, uh, but I want to leave you with this, with this one final thing. We can't do what we are setting out to do if everybody in here isn't on board. Unless everyone in here says, I am going to shape generations, I am going to uh, raise these children up to be resilient disciples, everybody needs to be a champion of this vision for us to change the culture around us. And so when you leave here today in your bulletin, if you were able to get one, I know we ran short, there are questions in there, but one of the questions is, uh, hold on, let me see that. Toss it up here. Boom. Thank you. i got to remember the exact wording. What practical way can you begin to champion the value of shaping generations, of being a generation shaper? I want you to think deeply about that question and how you can step up, whether it's serving in kids or youth ministry, uh, whether it's uh, talking about the things of God in your home and demonstrating a real faith, uh, whatever it might be, think about those things, pray about it, and commit to it. But let's pray. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, God, for the responsibility of being generation shapers, for the responsibility of raising children up and making disciples. God, you uh, are the good, good father. Lord, you are the perfect father and the perfect example. So God, would you guide us and help us as we uh, step into this uh, new uh, core value? Uh, God, I pray that this vision uh, and this value just uh, clings on to our hearts and we champion it and we take it and push it forward, Lord. God, I pray that uh, right now, uh, Lord, every household that is able signs up to be a foster, uh, a foster parent and solves the problem uh, that is plaguing uh, our nation uh, with uh, uh, kids who don't have a home to go to. 
Uh, God, may we be able to show radical love uh, and change the hearts and the lives of kids uh, who come uh, to restore, uh, who we see anywhere. God, may we just change uh, through our love, just change the way they see life. God, may they see their value and their dignity. May they see that they're made in the image of God, Lord, and I pray that we would not... uh, prohibit the youth from stepping up and serving and being leaders. Uh, God, may we uh, teach them to lead well. And God, may they be leaders in their schools. May they lead others to love you and live fully surrendered to you. And God, above all else, we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. We pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.